That was right. not what you just said, though. Yeah. Carl, one thing I did notice, uh, just kind of comparing uh, my farm to your farm, um, I do notice I do have a 20 by 100 uh, all metal kit there, but I don't have the uh, would be the ventilation like you do in the Gothic that you have that we looked at. I do have you know the roll up sides of course, and to compete with that, I took the plastic off the doors and went with some uh, some uh, outdoor window film netting kind of mm -hmm. style to kind of get the breeze to go through there to exit through, and it's helped a little bit. But I still you know have not got the opportunity yet to put any vents in or anything like that up there. Um, but I did notice the Gothic has that. Um, what and now you've got multiple high tunnels there, mm -hmm. so. What's what do you think the difference is between the ventilation in that gothic versus like a standard yeah. style hoop style generic hoop mm -hmm. style high tunnel? So we've got um, three different styles right now. We've got the that first one you saw. That's mm -hmm. uh, and they're all twenty by sixty five ish. But uh, that's a ten foot hoop, and then the the gutter connects. Those are uh, about thirteen feet tall, and then that one's not vented yet, just because of time. <clears throat> But then you go to that Gothic, which you notice today, and that one's about 16 feet tall, I believe. Um, but even just walking in those two, so again, that Gothic has small, just a louver on one end, a 24-inch louver, and then the other side's a 24-inch exhaust fan. But even if those two were just shut, not even on, it still is remarkably different between that one and, say, the Gothic, or, sorry, the uh, the gutter connecting to the 12 foot. Now, why do you think that? Because of the Gothic design, actually the cathedral it's style design? It just gets design? that heat off of the plants. I mean... Um, now I haven't left that, you know, those vents shut all day, right. um, to, to see, you know, at some point, right, that heat's going to fill up and start working its way back down towards the plant. But there is something, there's some science or, you know, something behind obviously right. that, getting that heat mass. And now, you know, I, when I watch videos of other farmers and big operations, now that's what I always notice is just the amount of room they have in there. And I'm, I mean, I'm seeing this just even empirically through like at our grow room. Like I built a seven foot ceiling wall and cause I was trying to preserve the space on top, right. but there's no airflow. Like I have so much humidity and so much, you know, like I can't get air. Like you don't realize like air is a, is a, is a real right. thing, you know, just cause you can't see it. It doesn't mean that it's not there. And so um, this, you know, this year has just been enlightening in, in all of that. And, and especially in the Gothic, cause like I said earlier, uh, when you're out there, it was, I was amazed at how big that thing was, and I was questioning if I would go with another one of those, or uh, you know, maybe a something in between. But right. after uh, after the summer, I mean, it's just it's clear. Like I need that that height on that height on it. Yeah, like it's 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 in. I don't want to say it's enjoyable, but it's enjoyable being in there working. Like if all things that we have to do on the farm, if you've got to do chores in the middle of July here, right? That's the place that you want to be, you know. <laughs> right. You put the newbies outside in the bare sun. And the, <laughs> the old people go work in the in the Gothic, you know. I did have another question for you. I noticed. I, I asked. Uh, I talked to Nick about this earlier in the car. He said you need to talk to Carl about that. And I think I know your answer because I went down that road already. Why are your tunnels sixty five feet long? <laughs> It's a funny story. I think I know that. I, I think I'm at the same point as my first tunnel. I made sixty five foot long. Yeah. And I'll never do it again. So no. I, 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 I noticed that when I got there, I asked Nick, I said, uh, how long are those? And he told me, and I started laughing. He goes, you need to ask Carl why yeah. they're that way. Because I think it's the same reason why. Well, work. I bought a used tunnel is what it was. And the spacing were six feet. Mm -hmm. and so it was a 100-foot tunnel they advertised online. You know, you know, and, uh, yeah, it was a Facebook marketplace deal. And um, so, of course, went up there not knowing anything. And then I get it, and I'm like doing some research, and they're saying, you know, five feet max but you should be at four feet right so then when i did that shrunk it down and 64 feet and now that has become the standard for everything and so i'm the same way i would rather like if you're gonna do it you know do a 50 big, or 100 yeah go big or go home and you know guess. what i found out is you know i did it i did mine for space is what i did when i put my diy in i was limited to amount of space because i had an apple tree that was behind mine oh. and i hadn't cut it down yet and so when i measured it out that's where i ended up and I was like, well, I'll just make everything 65 foot. It's no big deal, you know. Well, without doing, you know, and this is also, again, you know, beginning farming. When you're getting out, you think farming's farming. You just do what you need to do. Yeah. Well, then I found out pretty quick that shade cloth, frost blankets, drip tape, everything comes in 50 or 100s because yeah. that's the standard that everybody has, the standard, I guess you want to call it. So that kind of 
mess me up, you know, because I'm either going to have to buy 100, cut it down, yeah. figure out what I'm going to do with the excess waste of it, or do what I do and just kind of pin pieces together to extend yeah. the, the pieces, which mm. does not look aesthetically pleasing to me. I'm, and so that kind of little stuff like that bothers me. So it's like if knowing that those pieces are spliced together yeah. will almost keep me up at night, knowing that, yeah. you know, and so... That's why when I ran around with our new kit, I was like, no, I need 100 foot. That's what I need. Everything's going to go to 100 foot or 50. That's yeah. that's how I did it. But no, I just thought it was the same way. He, he kind of smirked and laughed when, when we were talking. He goes, that's something you probably need to yeah, ask, uh, <laughs> ask him and about. I, it <clears throat> ended up working in, uh, you know, all the details of, of being, um, you know, having some standards on. Because like our beds, outdoor beds are 30 and our long beds are 90. And right. so in the Gothic, it's 60 or in the in our high tunnels and in, in the Gothic are, are 60. So. All of our stuff still works, so we, um, you know, of course, from if we apart from if we do like landscape fabric, then we have to cut that. But we could use two thirties, and that covers a bed. Right, right. And so it still kind of plays in well with standards. But those are things that you don't think about when you're first starting up. It's like you hear people say, "Hey, have a standard, pick a bed size," but you don't know what you're doing until you start. You know, I right? Mean, because so, what's the standard? What's yeah. your standard? Twenty foot. 30 mm. foot, 50 foot, 100, 200, I don't, you know, everybody's right. going to be different because you're limited to what land you have to farm on. Yeah. You know, so no, I just thought it was kind of when, when I saw that for the first time, I was like. Yeah, when you said, said that, that earlier that's... that yours was 20 by 65, I thought, hmm, that's funny how you ended up with your number. But... Mine was the same way. It's just yeah. the space that I was limited to, you know. Um, I do, you know, I did get a chance to walk through all the tones to kind of look at what you're doing versus like what we're growing there. And everybody seems to be growing pretty much the same stuff. Just, you know, the years are, di the seasons are different. You know, I can go a little, you know, a little uh, longer in while you're going, you know, you're starting stuff a lot earlier than me. You get mm -hmm. a chance to, you know, grow some of your summer crops into the fall where we don't get that, you know, we don't get that option. But the variety wise, um, is there a certain varieties that you pick like this, like, I know you're just a startup, just like I am a couple mm -hmm. years into this. Is there something that every year you're picking the same varieties and this is, is it customer driven? Is it price driven? Or is it just, yeah. this is what you wanted to set a standard to? And it depends. So lettuce, for sure, we have kind of said, I mean, we're limited on lettuce. So we're, you know, trying to grow obviously year round and, and every year we, we're able to get further. So now we're at the end of July and we're able to still have lettuce. Not sure how much longer, but um um, so that we've, we're set on like the varieties, like we, we know that we have to use Nevada, uh, for a leaf, Adriana for a butterhead and, uh, like a Salanova Chris for, uh, you know, for a kind of a, a mix. So, um, but on the, on the tomato side, I thought we were set on some of those. I, I was talking earlier today about these 4th of July's, mm -hmm. it's a burpee seed. It's a little four ounce, you know, uh, early maturity date. And I love that one. But now this year I've realized it's just always, it gets gassy as soon as it gets hot. So. It's like I, we're too young to say we're set on all these, but I know that any filter and anything that I do now, you know, I go research, make sure it's right. heat tolerant because it's just, you know, it's it's overwhelming. I mean, especially varieties. I, um, I think I noticed it before, but my dad once sent me a magazine and it was for seeds and I thought it was just a general seed catalog. It wasn't a magazine that was just tomato seeds. And I thought, I'm, I'm just going to quit. Because there's like no way I'm ever going to be able to figure out what variety I should go right. for. You know, I mean, granted, you've got you've got limitations on that seed or on that catalog because, you know, you're wherever you're getting them from. Right. right. I and mean, you're you're going to go through and figure out what what's good for your, you know, indeterminate right there cuts off maybe 30 percent. Yeah. You know, the climate is another 30 percent. So you can whittle that down to where you're maybe at a. A cliff note, but still, you've got hundreds, if not thousands. And I think that's the thing a lot of people don't understand getting into this. You know, I've said it more than one time on my channel and just talking in general to people is there's a there's a romantic thing to market farming. And yeah. there's a lot of people that I think gear that into the romance part. And, and, and I think there's more to it than that. It's not just growing a tomato or growing a head of lettuce or growing anything like that. I mean, just like you touched on is the climate difference, mm -hmm. just the difference between me and you is a totally different yeah. tomato variety. Now, the lettuce varieties that you are growing, you know, I'm growing some Salanova, but I'm also growing, um, I haven't, I'm going to start growing some mirror, but I grow Tropicana, I grow Cherokee, a little Magenta, and then I don't grow any butter. So yeah. I just keep that and I do a foundation mix from the Salanova part of it. And so just that alone, we've changed the varieties of lettuces from where you're more into the more 
heat extreme that you need and then i'm more towards yeah. a little northern growing but not far but you know just a little bit off just a you know a couple zones off or a zone off what are you at you what know? zone are you at? uh we are 6a 6a all right so can you grow like the salanova green butter yes i grow okay. all four yeah see that one's yeah that's that's just we can't do that one it, it gets bitter and can't it's just the different. Yeah, it's weird. It's just the bit. difference. That's just a little bit yeah. of difference in there. Yeah, um, but I did notice you, uh, you touched on earlier too. Is I said you guys are adding more structures. We talked about yeah. that earlier also. So that's something that you guys are doing. Um, how many more are you adding, or what are you planning on adding to the farm? Well, we're hoping to double our uh, indoor, you know, our covered crop basically. So it's just to eliminate all the. And I've said this before. I don't, hopefully, it don't sound like a broken record. Yeah. But it's like. <clears throat> All the controls, you know, it went, the more dials that you can control, the, the better off. I, you know? I agree with it's you like, 100% on that. I mean, you, I don't know if you saw the collards out there, but you, well, you probably mm -hmm. didn't because you couldn't tell them apart from, it looked like a weed bed, basically. Yeah. You know? It's like, to, to one, you've got to be motivated at 106 degrees to go outside and weed, and, and two, just keeping up with this, you know, everything just, the plants don't thrive, but the weeds are loving this right you know, so and i love growing I, you know i'm we're striving to be 100 percent undercover that that is what my goal is i have a uh, a five-year goal you know i'm on year two now my five-year goal so i'm exactly where i want to be for my five and i've extended it out to five years so i'm not over stressing myself or, or trying to get above myself you know with um and i know you have some employees that work with you yeah. on part-timers mm -hmm. and see so I haven't got to that point yet, so I still have to keep everything where I can control yeah. all that stuff myself. And so, you know, I I could add more stuff, and I, you know, it, it's there. I want to add it, you know, and I have to hold myself back a little bit and say, hey, wait till next year. We're going to add one more. So every year, our goal is to add one more tunnel every year, yeah. so we have one more bed taken out of production, out what I call outside, like you know, out weather, mm -hmm. and then bring them inside so I can control them. Um, so. How do you look at compared pest wise for your pests outside versus in the tunnels? Um, you know, we could, you know, everybody's got grasshoppers, everybody's got yeah. stuff like that. So, have you noticed a lot of pest damage inside versus outside? Like, yeah. So, our biggest thing this year, it, we have struggled with cucumbers. Like, we just want to grow up. That's my wife's favorite produce is cucumbers, and that and watermelon. And, um, last two years this is our third year now growing these cucumbers at least you know commercially or semi-commercially here and we have been failed miserably and this year i was just pumped i bought greenhouse <laughs> varieties right. i bought i mean just you know i spent some time with nick trying to even you know like i've got to figure this out you know i mean this is my third time and and uh and so in the gutter connect i just loaded that thing up we did uh, five, four double rows so you know whatever four or five hundred plants you right. know, we've got in there maybe three four hundred plants in that one and i didn't have that screen netting on that i now have and i mean i had it but we were going to add on that bay so i thought i'm not going to do that because i'm going right. to take it down and well you know lo and behold we have lost all of them twice this year and so i just kept kick or i started replanting them so i finally put on the 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 screen netting but so all that being said is the the infamous cucumber beetle is just i mean relentless on our property i mean he's everywhere he's he's a pretty bug you know he's, <laughs> have you seen him I yeah mean, he's kind of like a, a ladybug but you know it looks kind of like more your, orangey your, yeah your, uh volkswagen bug is what he looks like with wings i just you know it makes me want to lose my religion every time i see one I mean, seriously, <laughs> it, just, it, it just gets me right in my gut i want to start going ballistic on him but yeah and so those guys are um pretty bad i'm sure you have them up there right yeah we do we don't have a lot of damage we grow and this year is the first year i started growing cucumbers in the tunnel okay i've always grown them outside we have i don't know probably i would say probably 100 125 cucumber plants outside yeah. that we grow i call them just the generic basic field cucumber yeah um and so they seem to be okay and we don't have a lot we have cucumber beetles we do get them but um we don't seem to get any damage from them, to be mm -hmm. honest. Uh, now, I don't know if it's just because of our climate's a little different and they haven't come out yet. Yeah. We don't grow a lot of melons. Um, the first year, we grew a lot of cantaloupe and watermelons, and we did have some on that. Um, but since then, we haven't. So I'm not sure. Uh, we have a lot of Japanese beetles, <laughs> for yeah. sure, Japanese beetles. Uh, and squash recent... bugs? Yeah, we have squash bugs. But I also control like the squash bugs on my zucchini and all that stuff from later plantings so yeah. i'll miss the first half to bring it into the summer to go into fall right. so i kind of break that cycle i'm a big believer of if you can break that cycle yeah. from either larvae or pupae or something like that 
that that's half winning's half your battle right, right there because you're breaking that cycle from the beginning where a lot of people get frustrated with like squash bugs for instance you know they're putting them in at least in our area we're doing it in late april first of may somewhere in that area you guys are probably way earlier than that from us but um everybody always gets daunted with it and then yeah. people get frustrated they give up uh, and then, you know, there's no more squash and zucchini for the rest of the year. But I find if I just delay that by 30 days and yeah, I'm missing the boat on the beginning half, but I'm gaining so much more on the back half from just stress enough from not having to worry about bugs all the time. Plus I get that, like I was explaining to you earlier is that you get that wave of people that falls coming. Everybody's looking at coffee lattes and all that pumpkin spice and all that and you're still providing a little kiss of summer coming in yeah. and people still want to hold on to that little bit of summer you know right. they're not ready to give up you know they're slicing tomatoes and stuff like that for the fall crops yet yeah. so um but yeah but saying that you know my issues this year have been thrips like terrible i i've had some awful <laughs> like devastating losing a couple thousand heads of lettuce, devastating thrip damage, you know. And so, you know, lettuce, I'm, I'm more known for our salad and our lettuces and stuff where we're at. And so to lose that, to lose that income coming in and stuff, it's been pretty stressful. And, and yeah. so, uh, you know, I'm, next week I'm getting started back up again to get ready to get pushing in the fall and stuff like that. So everything will be all right. It's just this is my first devastating loss yeah. on the farm. To where, you know, everybody loses a little, you know, when it comes to market gardeners, I find out, you know, um, you're not growing half a dozen tomato plants, you know, we're growing two, three hundred tomato plants at a yeah. time. And if you lose 25 percent of that, which which I call your generic loss anyway, you know, you're you're losing 50, 60 plants. You still got 150, 200 plants to fall back on, you know, so but when you lose a whole, right. that'd be like you losing a whole tunnel of yeah. tomatoes. Right. It, that's it's pretty devastating to the pocketbook as well as just your mental health, you know, yeah. because you put a lot of invest a lot of time, you know, a lot of weeding, a lot of seeding, a lot of transplanting, a lot of stuff like that. So yeah, um, that's definitely a big one. Well, it's you know it's it is tough to swallow, but at the same time, you you, you will likely not deal with that ever again. Like yep. when when you have something that significant of an impact. You know, like it creates an imprint so much so that you are always aware and you always are protected and safeguarded against that. You know, like for us, like I think we're forever protected against frost damage. Like we, because <laughs> we learned the hard way <laughs> right. last year, you know, we had a freak frost in April 22nd. I just was looking at the, the uh, receipts the other day when I was doing my taxes. Yes, it's July and I'm just doing my taxes. But um, anyways, uh, I, I was looking at all that and recalling like because we had everything strung up and we got hit with a frost in late april here which is crazy and, and so we, we're, we're fully prepared no matter you know i should right. say that and, but you know it left such a mark on me that like i know how to do it now in the winter time and then you know in, in floods and, and so anytime you get hit with these random things it's like yeah it hurts but on the flip side you are more prepared like imagine that now happening when you're you know, right. 10 times bigger as a farmer right. and that what, like that would likely put you out, yeah. you know, but now you've got that, you know, yeah. And, 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 and it's a good thing, you know, um, like I said, I, I was pretty, not so much depressed, but pretty upset at myself yeah. for letting it happen well, to one for, for letting it happen. And, and I think you should explain it so people know, because <laughs> you, even if you have the netting, right. I mean, explain. Yeah. It to the... Um, when I built my high tunnels, you know, last year I didn't have any insect netting on it, but I wasn't growing lettuces into the summer as far. And so we were more geared towards like tomatoes and stuff like that. So it really didn't affect it. Yeah, a little hornworm damage, but something you can control and live with. And when I built our new tunnel, when we started this series and I got the new tunnel and I started building it, and I had this idea, I was like, I was like, I want to put insect netting on both tunnels. That way I won't have to deal with hornworms anymore. And I'll never have to deal with an insect ever in my life, yeah. you know, and and everybody's like, yeah, well, good luck with that. And I was like, oh, no, it's simple. I got this under control. Well, I was unaware. You know, I bought insect netting from a well-known company. Um, and it's a very good insect netting, very, you know, high-end insect netting thing. But I was unaware there was two kinds. You know, until uh, I had the professor from K-State come out and do an evaluation on my, my tunnel where I actually had my thrip damage and let me know what I need to do in the future to take care of it and all that stuff. Like, There's videos to come on that, guys. So. But uh, 
he told me there was two different kinds of insect netting, and I needed a kind that was thrip proof. And I was like, uh, well, that, that's weird. How, how does that work? And he said, well, you have, and I can't remember the exact wording that he had, but there's two different kinds. One of them will keep everything out but thrips, because I, apparently thrips are like a millimeter wide or something or a millimeter long and they're like they're super super small hmm. you almost need a magnifying glass or some type of optical to see them correctly and so and then there's the kind that will keep thrips out hmm. and so he said if you get that kind you'll be able to keep the thrips out but there's always a win and lose on both sides right. of the picture here so let's say for instance you know when i had my old netting on which was actually just physically just deer netting i got you know, I put that in to keep raccoons, any type of snakes, anything like that out of my tunnel, but it would still let pollinators in. And so what I did was this year, I was like, well, I'm going to take that off and I'm going to put insect netting on so I don't have any type of bug damage at all. Well, here I go, I get this whole thrip damage here and it literally just, you know, yeah. annihilates a couple thousand head of starts and, and let us already in the tunnel for this year. And so when we put this netting on, he said, okay, now, now keep in mind, you know, insect netting is a barrier to keep insects out, but it also will keep wind out. Mm -hmm. So he said, when you go to that thrip style, he said, it'll keep the thrips out, but it'll also block a lot of the wind because yeah. the, the holes for that netting is also so small. So he said, it's kind of a game of Russian roulette. What, which is the finer evil there? Do you keep the yeah. bugs out and then have a tunnel that's 125 degrees right. <laughs> every day? Or do you mm -hmm. just kind of live with what you got or, or less, and then get the breeze through. So you kind of have to figure out what's important yeah. to you. And like he said, there's plenty of organic ways of controlling thrips. But, you know, the, the key to any kind of insect control, control is uh, either breaking a cycle or using the type of uh, organic um, right. things that you need to use. You know, there's a lot of stuff you can use organic. You know, mineral oil, I didn't know this, but mineral oil will actually take care of some thrips. Um, you can use a little pyrethrin, stuff like that that you need. And, you know, and I think a lot of people get tied into, oh, I don't want to spray. I'm not a spray. I'm an organic farm. Well, there's a lot of organic yeah. ways of controlling stuff. And it's not just with your hands. You know, there, right. there's also stuff you can use, you know, neem oil, stuff like that. That's all organic mm -hmm. stuff. That's all organic proved. Um, but so there is a good and evil on that kind of stuff. So, you know, I learned something from my mistake. Um, not, not necessarily, but it's not my mistake. I, I take full control of it because it's my farm yeah. but um i had no no idea right. you know I, I didn't know there was such a thing but now i do so yeah. like you said with the frost now going forward it's a mental note in my head that i will never yeah allow this to happen to me again you know so now i'm gonna go forward in my mind next year saying all right now i know i'm gonna probably get some type of insect damage somewhere i'm going to have to think forward with that so i need to get my omri certified stuff ready to go so that way I've got my sprays if I need it or possibly watching what I'm doing with my or possibly watching what I'm doing with my transplanting and stuff like that. You know, I, I saw a little bit of damage in my seed starting trays, but I didn't know what it was. I just thought it was the heat. So I went ahead yeah. and planted some stuff, not knowing that it was already the trays were basically infested with them when they came in. And I went ahead and just put them in the ground. So all I did was give make a high tunnel of a buffet. Yeah. For right. them just to come in and, and obliviate me. And that's what happened. It took a week and a half, two weeks, and I lost it all. So we're about the same age, I guess, if you will, in terms of our experience, right, on, on our farm. We're about right. two, two, and I think this is, we're about two and a half years now. Yep. I'm sure that was, typically everybody starts in the spring. It makes sense. Um, so what kind of successes and, I mean, things that, you know, one that's keeping you going, um, and two, like things that you know that you kind of have solidified that are banked, you know, like we were just talking about, like, you know, frost, right? We've got that covered, but like, what are some things that are keeping you moving, the winds that you're seeing and, and things that are. Okay. And I, I know with us anyway, I, you know, for one, I, I thought I had the lettuce game <laughs> nailed down apparently and, and that didn't happen, you know, but that's kind of stuff out of my control. Um, one, we, we're really good at weed control. I'm a stickler on, on no weeds, um, no grasses. Well, that's all considered a weed to me. What are you doing for? Give it's, some tips. Here. It's all on bed prep. Uh, to me, it's all on prep. I use higher end compost. Um, I'm lucky to have a company where we live that actually makes their own compost. So I buy higher end compost and we wood chip every walkway, every pathway's wood chipped. 
uh, we cover crop all the tunnels and then I tarp. So I use a lot of silage tarps to kill off stuff. And I'm just always weeding. And it and it's not, it sounds like a, a dauntless kind of task, but it's not. I I bet you I only spend 30 minutes a week weeding. That's mm. it. Um and, and and it's all on bed prep. But also, you know, I have less uh beds than you do. You're 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 a bigger version. You're probably twice as big as I am on my farm. You know, I have the two high tunnels and I have I think another 3,000 square feet of outside beds, and yeah. that's it. And I've limited myself to something I can control as one right. person control. Yeah. And so, you know, to me, uh, the weeds is my, is a nemesis to me. So I'm, I'm very big in controlling the weeds and stuff. Yeah. And, and it's basically a lot of tarping, um, a lot of deep compost mulch beds. So I'll do like a six to eight inch layer of compost in, 30 inch wide beds, 18 inch walkways, just standard market farming stuff. And I, uh, wood chip all the walkway, so that helps out a little bit. And then when I see a weed, I pull it like right, right away, even if it, it's something small. I don't let them get yeah. past this big. So I mean, are you and, going through every week with a colander or hoe or something? Or single time cultivator, a uh, uh, little single time cultivator hoe. But do um, you do that? I mean, is that kind of part of your regimen? That yeah, you... I'll do that one day a week, and it's literally I'll hit all of my beds, and it'll take me five minutes to do all of my beds with it. And then do you use landscape fabric? Are you cutting holes? I do landscape fa fabric for long-term crops, like cucumbers, okay. tomatoes, anything, peppers, anything that's going to be in the ground longer than 30, yeah. 40 days. I do lettuces, open bed. Same thing indoor? Indoor and outdoor, indoor. same thing. Same, same methodology? Same, everything the same. The only difference is now I control the weather. That's the only right. thing that happens in the tunnels. Um, the other thing I would say that we do really well that I'm pretty proud of is my irrigation. So everything's, um, we don't do overhead anything. The only thing we overhead is corn. That's about the only thing. Mm -hmm. And we're, we're not marketable for corn. We don't sell corn. In our area, everybody sells corn. And it just seems like we can't make money selling corn because there's always some guy undercutting you by 50 cents to yeah. get that sale. And so we grow a lot of corn for ourselves. And that's the only thing I overhead irrigate. And I used to run corn on drip also. Yeah. But this year we overheaded it because it's such a small patch. But we do a lot of drip irrigation. So everything's on drip that works out very well for us everything's on timers kind of like your setup the same yeah. same kind of concept we run digital timers and then you know everything gets watered twice a day uh for an hour and a half to two hours per time so i really get those beds really really moist and i and i keep everything really really going yeah it's a little hard on the water bill but um the plants seem to need that water yeah. when it's when it's time you really have to pump the the water to those guys to keep especially cucumbers tomatoes yeah. anything that you that that use that that's basically water right. you know anything that's you know basically water but uh i would say those two things are probably my my two takeaways from my farm that i am like super super yeah. proud of now you know i have crop you know i have crops i do really well in uh, we grow okra really well but i think yeah. pretty much everybody does want you know okra will grow anywhere um, we do a lot of, a lot of green beans, a lot of greens, mm -hmm. like three, 400 green bean plants. And, uh, I'm pretty proud of the way we grow our green beans works out really good. Well, lettuces and stuff we're really good at, but you know, this year I had some issues with the insect damage, but we go through all that. But, um, so you, cause you're, you're, um, eventually going to be growing lettuces year round, but you don't do any overhead for a little cooling. And... <sighs> Here's my take on that. And that was the question I had when I had these thrips. You know, they said that thrips really thrive in a lot of humidity, a lot of wet conditions without airflow, stuff like that. So I, on purpose, you know, you can tuck Salanova and stuff pretty tight to each other. You know, six, seven yeah. inches is what Johnny's, I think, will tell you to tuck that in. I go 12. Mm. I like a little bigger head, but I also like to have that space to kind of get a little yeah. air flowing around there. And when it started getting hot, I was kind of misting the top of it with an overhead sprayer two or three times a day, kind of keep the wilt down. And I don't know if that really mm. brought them like a dinner bell into them because they yeah. thrive in that moist humidity kind of kind of thing. Yeah. And I've never done that before. This is this was the first time I've ever done that overhead. Oh. And so, and Man, then it wasn't skeptical. two weeks into yeah. it, boom, I got slaughtered. Mm. And so now I'm like a little gun shy from the overhead. And I know there's a lot of people that overhead miss yeah. stuff. And, and, and I'm just like, ah. I don't know about that because I've always just run the drip and that was well, it. And maybe not so much a mist like, but what we're doing with those sprinkler heads we have, I mean, they're, it's not a mist, it's a drop, but all it is, I mean, just think if you're standing out there and somebody just kind of ran a, you know, a hose against right. you, right? I mean, just that instant cool refreshing. And so that's the, whereas the mist 
I could see that maybe, you know. You're running, but your lettuce more. is outside in beds, right? Yeah. And see, mine are, is in the tunnel, so I wonder if the tunnel yeah. is keeping the airflow because I've got the insect netting on there. Then maybe it's not yeah. getting a lot of airflow to kind of dry, I uh, say dry those lettuces off so they're not just like sitting right. in, in, in a moist environment. And that could be maybe I need to throw more fans in there. I've got one big fan in there now, um, but it's more geared towards the top of the tunnel to kind of blow the air, circulate the air around. Maybe I need to do a couple facing down to actually blow yeah. on the lettuce beds itself. And see, that's all where we're getting into this whole thing about learning how to farm. You know, yeah. there's, I don't care if you're six months in or 20 years in, you're always going to learn something yeah. new from keep someone. Keep you know, you're always going to keep improving on, on your farm and stuff. And that's, you know, farming is just, you know, there's no book. You know, I always tell people all the time, there's not a Bible for it yeah. where I can just go in and open it up and say, oh, that's how yeah. I fix my issue. You know, you get people that'll tell you, well, this is what you need to do. It still happens. Yeah. <laughs> yeah you know, it, it, it's, things are going to happen. Things yeah. are going to happen. You know, and unfortunately, like you brought on is that, you know, once that gets mentally in your head, now I know. Mm. Now that's always in the back of my mind. All right, this could happen. What do I need to do to try to fix this right. issue? You know, and I think that's how we all learn from each other. You know, even though we're, you know, far enough apart, I think we both can learn from each other's farms and be like, all right, well, I remember... You know, Carl was saying this is what happened to him, or I remember, hey, this is what Tracy was saying, what happened yeah. to him. Now I need to think about that also. You know, that's something that you may not have thought of. Yeah. Okay, Carl, since you asked me that question, I'm going to just turn it over and ask you the same exact question. So what keeps you guys going on a day-to-day -day basis, or, or what goals that you have set, you know, that, that you're reaching towards, or maybe you have reached your goals? I'm, I'm not sure. I've yeah. never really spoke with you about that. Well... One, we're still here, so that's keeping us going. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Every, and this time of year, I mean, the fact that I'm optimistic in late July here in North Texas is is promising because last, the last two years in July and August, and, uh, you know, we're always joking about this, like, but every July and August, we wonder why, why are we doing this? You know, because it, the heat gets so oppressive, the plants are dying, you can't function much outside. Right. But this year, I feel like, you know, it's, the fact that we're still going, we've got, we've motivated, you know, um, we, and the bigger thing I think that drives us is just the demand in our customers. And, you know, the fact that I still come home wondering how much more can I produce? You know, right. Because I, I feel like I'm still letting our customers down because we can't bring enough and we can't get, you know, what we have to last as long. So now it's becoming a challenge of how do I get, you know, let us to go, you know, a little further. Right. How do I? How do I get you know tomatoes and you know to to not shrivel up in in you know late summer and or middle of summer for that matter here. But um, that and then also just you know seeing seeing where we're at and and you know whereas two years ago it was like kind of just yeah let's try this to now it's it's a level of devotion and kind of commitment right to it and so those are the things that are really drive me. One, I, we're, I feel responsible because of our you know, customers right. that are behind right. us waiting every week, you know, they're there standing in line waiting to get some produce. And so there's a level of responsibility. And now we've taken ownership of that. Like, you know, we, we are literally part of, you know, maybe a hundred people's lives every week. Right. And so that, that's kind of rewarding. Um, so that, and then um, again, the challenges that's, that's, I, I love a good challenge um, as long as I'm winning, you know, you know <laughs> two steps forward, one right, step right, back. Kind right, of thing, right, you right. Know? A good two-step uh, dance on that, I guess. So, um, but on some of the things I feel, and I, I might say in both ways, things that I feel like we're succeeding and, and failing. Um, but like weeding, you know, we we've, we have it. We have some of our beds under control. But at the same time, as you saw today, there's certain crops like the long-term crops. I can't, you know, I just with all the, that we going on, we have going on because we we kind of sprawled. You know, we right. we went faster wide than we did deep in terms of. Uh, perfecting things on a small scale. And so the cost of that has been not being able to maintain things to the level of, of satisfaction. So like our collards, as I said earlier, you can't tell that there's a collard bed there. They're there and you can go pick them. And maybe some of those weeds are actually protecting those leaves from this heat. Right. Because here right. we are in the middle of July, so harvesting collards. But um, And so um, on one hand, I feel like we have our, our weed control process and methodology down, but the other side of it, it's like their long-term crops, like our carrots in college, just, the, you know, we can't maintain all these beds uh, effectively. So that's kind of a, um, a wash, I think. But, and then irrigation, I would, I would agree with that. We use a combination of overhead 
that one field on the north side, 30 foot beds, is all overhead. And mm -hmm. all we do, we use that because that's for like all our carrots, lettuces, radishes, stuff that we, we plant uh, either direct sow um, where we can cover them with a the landscape fabric and then allow that overhead to germinate those and just to get it even, you know, like I feel like we've got that down. Like everybody comes to me and says, oh, we can't get carrots to grow. And I'm like, well, this is what you got to do. You know, and so we've got these, some of these practical steps down, you know, to recreate, especially because we're doing succession crops. You right. know? So we're planting these things in a, not right now, but, uh, you know, come, um, you know, all, middle of August, September, we're doing the same thing for six, eight months. Every two weeks we're planting carrots, direct, uh, you right. know, carrots, radishes, uh, our fall or spring mix, kind of the same thing. We just changed the title of it. Um, spinach, you know, baby spinach and all of these, uh, leaves and, and things. So, um, I feel like we're getting that down and that, um, um, then assumes that we've got our succession planting down, which I feel like we, we have that for the most part. Cause that was, that's really confusing when you first right. start like, okay, you know, typical gardener, you think you go out there and you plant one time for the year and you're, you're done. That's when what you're you done, do. you're done. You put your yeah. potatoes in the ground. When you harvest, you're done. When you put your corn. But, yep. you know, on our scale, you've got to have the produce every week or can have consistency for that crop, at least during the season. And so um, I feel like I've got the winter stuff done, but down, but not the summer, like the sweet corn and the, you know, that where, where I still have this mentality shift of you plant it once in the spring and once in the fall, you know, because we can get two crops of sweet corn. And, and that's that's wrong. I mean, I, and it just dawned on me this year. I'm like, why am I not planting that? every right. three weeks you know or, um so um that and again the uh the tomato suckers this is you know i've failed like three years in a row now i've been trying to get clones off of my plants that i've you know the plants that i've been enjoying right. saying hey these guys are great but i can't get them to um to you know live <laughs> i keep killing all my clones off so but yeah so it's kind of a it's kind of a balance uh, sounds like we have the same battles or the same challenges but they're just on a different different plane yeah. You know, um, where we both seem to be doing the same thing the right way. It's just, it's just, you know, a little different challenges. You know, you have more, more humidity, stress, kind of heat level mm -hmm. like that. Where we're having kind of like, I know everybody's having like a weird summer, but we're having like a very, very weird heat yeah. loving summer where we're at. You know, we do have hundred degree days there and stuff. You know, we're still in Kansas, so it's not like we're in North Dakota or Canada or something right. where it's cooler. You know, but when you do 30 days of 100 degree weather with no right. rain, that that's, you know, very stressful where we're at, you know, because we don't usually get that. Usually you're getting 10, 11, 12, 13 days of 100 degree weather, and then you're getting low 90s, high 80s, yeah. you know, mid 90s, somewhere in that. But, you know, it's and then we're all variety driven. So, you know, the like we talked about earlier, the varieties of tomatoes I'm growing is way different than the varieties you are versus cucumbers, everything else. Well, when you take a, a tomato variety that, that, the tomatoes are just not tomatoes. And I think that's a weird thing is people, you know, they they go down to the local box store and they're like, well, I need to get a pack of tomatoes. I'm going to, you know, start yeah. those. If you open up any seed catalog or get online and just Google tomato varieties, it'll blow yeah. your mind. I mean, literally will blow your mm -hmm. mind, you know, and, and, and then you're trying to narrow it down. Okay. Now what do I want out of these thousand varieties? Right. But I think a lot of people don't look at where do you live? What's your climate and your weather like before you go ordering a tomato that grows very well in a yeah. colder climate just because it looks pretty on a plate somewhere that somebody put on Instagram? You know, you think, I want to yeah. grow that for my market stand here in Texas. Well, that's not going to work. Right. You, know, you know, you need to grow something that's got a little heat structure to it. And it's kind of the same way we are, you know. The first year of not being a market gardener, but the first year of actually being a large backyard gardener, I want to say before we actually took the plunge into doing it full time, it was like that for me. You know, you can ask my wife, I, I just, oh, we're going to have 50 different varieties of tomatoes. People are going to love it. They're yeah. going to buy it. I failed miserably. Like it, it was, it was terrible, you know, and that's where I took that mindset of, I, I need to do seven things very well, mm -hmm. but I need to crush two of them, you yeah. know, and my, my, and my two things I was going to crush was like lettuce, uh, lettuce, salad mix, stuff like that. And like carrots. Right. You know, that was my two things I was going to, that I was just going to kill it, you know? Mm -hmm. And, and so far we've been very lucky besides the thrip damage we've had, but we've been very lucky at, at yeah. that. Well, it, it's interesting because I, I, when I uh, first started getting into this, I um, had the same mindset of, of, and you're probably experimenting with this as well, but like pick a dozen things that you want to grow well. And, 
And I've never followed that. I will say though that I I followed that saying these are the these are the twelve things that I'm going to master, you know, or whatever. 10, right. Ten things I think is the book I was reading. Um, uh, but uh, the point is, is that I still well while I'm focusing on these. You know, I'm I'm not advertising, but I'm doing these other right, five things in the background. Because <laughs> I know I'm going to fail. I mean, I have two or three seasons to master, you know, some new varieties, and so yeah, I'm I'm focusing on these ten. But at the same time, I'm going to you know flick a couple seeds over in some other beds and see what they do. At right. least at least just to see what is it you know what how's the germination, how's it you know, and and you learn stuff just right. empirically, and so. Um, that's been, I, I will say for me this, this year, um, I've not been able to observe as much because of how the sprawl, that is a key thing, I think. And, and you have this luxury because you're doing it full-time yourself, whereas I'm, you right. know, you're still working. Yeah. Con, I work full-time and I hired people to do, you know, carry out my vision, which is really difficult um, and rewarding, right? I mean, we, we, we can, we're managing and we're doing right. it, but what I've noticed this year is that I'm failing to observe, you know, because that empirical like you're in there, you're seeing this is working, this isn't working. It's kind of right now on an autopilot. I'm not able to get in there and to say, oh, right. man, if I were to do X, Y, Z, you know, make some. If know, I would have noticed this a week yeah. and a half ago, exactly. maybe the outcome would have been a little different now where, yeah. you know, you're still doing your 40 hour week job and mm -hmm. then still trying to do this on top of that. So, yeah, that yeah. does make a big difference. Yeah. And that's a key thing. I mean, observation. I mean, it's just, you know, scientific you know, same same models that right. You've got to be there, very intimate with you know all the stages and what's going on, and and so uh, yeah, that's 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 a huge uh, a huge thing that I've been missing this year. Um, on the flip side, I will say like, um, I, and I've, we've seen uh, Gage. He's he's a, a young guy that works for us, but he multiple times now this year. He's like, oh, I get it. You know, like he came over and because we were getting hit by squash bugs, right? I mean, like majorly and all of a sudden he he realized like he saw the damage he saw like this one plant was not doing well and i told him I'm like it's either got to be getting impacted by bugs nutrients or water right? right those are the three things and and he was there and he's like i got it like as soon as i saw that plant i started checking it out and sure enough it was just loaded with bugs you know and so that that element uh, can can save you know money. yeah and and that that's good that's something that you've taught him to, yeah. to look at that, you know, maybe a basic home gardener wouldn't notice. They'd see a little bit of damage, like on a squash, yeah. and be like, well, we need to pull that because it's ready to die. Right. Well, like I said, it may just be a clogged nozzle on your drip tape. Yeah. That's not right. that's not water, and it's something as simple as a little bit of dirt in your drip tape, you yeah. know. So, yeah, I think there's a big thing on being observant um, mm -hmm. like that. And I do have that luxury where I get to be more hands-on with it. But, you know... Um, there's always room for improvement, no matter what you think you master or what you think you're good at. You know, there's always going to be somebody that's that's better than you at it. Yeah. You know, it's just that old adage of that. That's how it is. You know, if you think you're tough, there's always somebody tougher than you. Right. You know, it's the same. It's mm -hmm. the same thing when it comes to farming too. But I also think it makes us better farmers. You know, to have that type of, um, to have that type of issues when it comes to because if everybody was perfect, nobody would be. I mean, right. nobody would care. There, there wouldn't be any care. Um, into your product, you know, you would just be selling a product. You know what I mean? And 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 I think with us as market gardeners nowadays, I think there there's a lot of um, pride and a lot of care in your product. You know, you're asking a premium price for things. Mm -hmm. You know, and and most of the times people can go to the grocery store and get it a lot cheaper. You know, now the taste isn't there, for instance, the quality, the color, none of that's there. Yeah, it's it's life. a night, yeah, shelf life for, for one. So mm -hmm. it's a night and day difference. That's the reason why people are paying good money at farmer's markets to support your farm, to support my farm, yeah. uh, you know, small farms all across the country or all across the world, yeah. as a matter well, of fact. Well, they, they trust us knowing that, you know, I mean, there's a right. big question that people, I don't know why people think our foods come from China. It's really, you know, lettuces oh. aren't being shipped. Like nobody's <laughs> right. going right. to... Right. Right. You know, yeah. Well, maybe, yeah. maybe there is, but you know that's not the problem. But behind, there still is some truth behind that because people are questioning what's on their food, what's in their food, and and, and that's that's what's eye opening, right? It's like all these cancers and everything that's right. popping up. I'm not saying this is the the end all be all, but the fact that people are aware of their food, one, it, it tastes better if you buy it local. You know the person, you know all the experiences that goes along with just buying it. But but knowing that these people trust you, that you know what what you're putting on it is is edible, right? I always tell people, <clears throat> excuse me, you know, we put organic spray on if we have to, but I always want to make sure that I can go up and pick it right there and eat it. Right. You know? And and that's how I am. You know, I mean, there's, 
you know, there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of things going into where it's like, oh, we don't spray, we don't control anything, we don't do, you're, you're, you've got to do something. Yeah. You're, you've got to do something. Or, I mean, I don't know if anybody just lets insects desecrate their whole place right. and just, call, you know, you, you wouldn't be in business that long if you well, did. You did there's the first some, year. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there, there, there's, there's some kind of control somewhere that you're learning, hey, now I need to maybe, I need to look more into organic controls. Now, how do I do that? Oh, yeah, with this and this and this and this. And still... You know, still, like you said, still be able to go up and grab a tomato off the vine and eat it mm-hmm. and still feel secure about that. And I agree with you. People do trust us as small farmers to feed their family. And, you know, I always tell, you know, people the same thing when they ask about stuff. I'll say, you know, there's nothing that that I would not feed my family that I don't mm-hmm. feed your family. You're part of my journey as a farmer, and I'm here to support your family or grace your table like I would grace my own yeah. table. So, and I'm very transparent. You know, I... I you know, I think you have to be, you know, I do a lot of YouTube and a lot of stuff like that. So I have to be transparent. I believe in being transparent mm-hmm. about issues, even if it's bad issues. And um, I always allow people, hey, if you want to come check it out, this is where I'm at. You're more than welcome to stop by and swing by, say hi. You can kind of see how I'm growing, where I'm growing, why I'm growing. And I think that kind of secures people in yeah. their mind that, oh, well, I don't have to. I trust you. Yeah. But I think they like that fact that oh, wait, yeah, you're right down the road. I know exactly where you're. You're the guy that's got the high tunnels out of his yard. You know, because in my area, there's not a lot. There's people that grow, of course. There's people that have tunnels. Not a lot of people have tunnels like I have tunnels. You know, nobody is is, as weird enough like I am to put a high tunnel in their front yard. You know, like I was telling my wife when I first started doing that was, you know, this this grass doesn't make us any money. You know, this tunnel's going to make us money. So, you know, she's like, well, all right, do what you need to do, you know, and mm-hmm. boom, there's a big tie high tunnel. And everybody's like, look, he's got a high tunnel in his front. But now everybody knows who we are. Yeah. They know we're summer pick farms. They know what we do. They know where they're for when they go to the market. They, oh, yeah, I know where you guys are. You guys that, that have those multiple high tunnels in, you know, yeah. your yard and stuff like that. Yep, exactly. So, and I think that's a big, that's a big um, pleaser to people, and especially nowadays. Right. With, you know, with the food deserts we have going on or the economy, I mean, all that kind of stuff like that without getting too political and talking and that. But I think they're, that's a relief off their shoulder that mm-hmm. they don't have to worry about. They know, okay, I trust Carl. I, you know, I trust him every week. I see him every week. Him and his wife are there every week. I know who they are now right. and I trust him with our, with our food, you know. So I think that's a big deal. So are you, like, what's, what's your market? I mean, like the city, because you're Kansas City, you're outside of Kansas City? Yes. Like, how big is your, the city? Uh, the town I actually live in is about 1,200 people. Okay. And I'm right outside of that. The where? farmer's market, we do a farmer's market in Lawrence, which is the home of the KUJ Hawks. Go Hawks. Um, <laughs> um, national champion. But anyway, um, th- that town there, we do a nighttime market. And Lawrence is really big in the farmer's markets. Like, like What's they, the population, though? Uh, I want to say Lawrence is... God, I know that I'm gonna get this wrong, but I think it's anywhere from 85 to 150, okay. depending if the Which college is, is in or out. Size. It's a pretty good sized town. They have seven farmers markets for seven days oh, a week. Wow. So right. they do, I think, two or three at night, and then they do the rest during the day. So yeah. we do a Thursday night market, and it's more of a neighborhood style market. So there's literally uh, food trucks that show up, live music. We have a beer wagon from a local brewery comes and sets up there, and it's a it's really cool neighborhood kind of style market. And then we do um a saturday market of course saturday morning market and that's going to be in our bigger our state capital um so it's a little bigger i think i think topeka is like 140,000 people 135,000 people and we have two markets we have a downtown market and then we have a west side market and we're in the west side market um our west side market's a growers only market Mm. so that way you know when you get there you know it's grown from that guy you're not competing with wholesale or anything like that that. yeah and so I think I find, and it's a 65 vendor market. Our market on that side is 65 vendors. So we're a pretty big market. Yeah. Um, we still have the thing that I always talk about. I still have to explain to people what microgreens are. Yeah. So, I mean, even no matter how big a market you get to, even in a big market like that, you're still having to explain to at least, you know, every other person what a microgreen yeah. is. They still haven't got to see that part of it yet. But, um, yeah, it's a, it's, it's, we're pretty... Where we're at, we're small enough, but we have to kind of branch out to the bigger cities, just kind of like what you would have to, um, you know, what you do now to get out. But uh, yeah, I think it's, I think it's, it's getting better. I think the more and more um, this is going in this, um, oh, I want to say not, I hate to say it's like a way of living, but um, a new way of farming, I guess, you know, maybe 30 years ago, people were still market farming, but it wasn't nobody, you you weren't called a market farmer. 
you know, you I were either a truck, a farmer. truck farm, yeah. yeah, like a backyard farmer or a truck farmer or something mm-hmm. like that. You're the guy peddling corn or watermelons yeah. or something, which nothing's wrong with that, but that's what you were known. Right. You were kind of grouped everybody into that. Yeah, yeah monocrop. And mm-hmm. I think now that this market farming thing has taken off in the last 10, 15 years, you know, and now it's really blown up since, since COVID, um, I think that's kind of changed the game when it comes to, uh, when it comes to bringing food to your, to your communities and stuff like that. All right. The purpose of this, the purpose of our trip was to kind of take a break from the farm a little bit in this heat that we have. And also I wanted to kind of visit um, different farms in different regions that aren't in my region to see how everybody's doing anything. And a couple things I can take away from that. You're, you're like the third or fourth farm that I visited um, just today. So it was one of those things and we're getting ready to head to Dallas and visit some hydroponic stuff, visit some flower farms and stuff in the morning. But what I've kind of taken away from this so far is that there's really no set way. And I think we mentioned that with like, there's no Bible that's telling you how to grow this, uh, no cookie cutter way of doing this. But what I have noticed, everybody is like all over, like one per person's growing like this, one is growing yeah. like this, one is growing like, this. you know, I've seen everything the gamut today from, from uh, grapes, you know, mm-hmm. I've checked out some grapes, I've checked out cover crop, I've checked out the way somebody's growing their market style beds. And then you know, I've seen how you're growing yours, which is basically the same way I'm kind of growing mine. But um, it's kind of neat to see everybody's differences, but everybody's the same, you know. Well, there seems to be a, a, at least a framework, you know. I mean, even if that framework is, you know, soil, water, seed, but, you know, <laughs> yeah. you, you start narrowing that down. But there, there are commonalities and there's a general framework, but there's so much wiggle room you know, and in context and so many variables, right? That, you know, just like you were saying earlier, between right. your zone and my zone and in your context and my context, you know, that there's just different knobs you can change and options and that there's not one way, you know, there's not just this, this, you have to do it this way, right? you know, and, and you see that all the time, probably on the forums too, on Facebook, yeah. right? It's like somebody says, and I'm, I'm always reluctant to make a post on some of the groups I'm on, like, but I really do have a genuine question and you're going to get a hundred things. Well, have you done, you know, yes. you're doing this all wrong. You should be, I'm like, guys, I just have a very simple question. Like, you know, what has your, been your experience with this? But, you know, everybody wants to, you know, overlay a million different variables. Everybody's an armchair, that because, an armchair quarterback. Yeah, yeah. It, and there's just so many different ways to do it because there's not, there's not necessarily a wrong way to do it. Right. And, and I think that that goes in the, you know, I get questions like that all the time, just, even from family members about, you know, about growing stuff in the backyard is that, you know, how do we do this? How do yeah. we do There is no how, I, I mean, there is no how do we do this kind of idea. It's just basically, you know, it's kind of a live and learn kind of deal. And unfortunately, yeah. we've lived a lot and we've learned a lot about issues yeah. that we've had, you know. You know, when we start talking about scale, like how many variables change in that? Like, it seems like, you know, literally, if we go back to the cookie cutter example, it's like, oh, I have 10 beds and I'm going to go to 20 beds or I have two hoop houses. Now I'm going to go to four um, you know, what, what are the, the things that, that you're now faced with from like a scaling perspective? I mean, is it, people think, oh, it's just easier, right? You just, you just add another one. You just one, add but, another one. Yeah. Right. I mean, what, where do I start? Um, irrigation, water yeah. pressure. Yeah. Water, pr- and I think problems. water pressure is one that people don't think about is like, you know, you run drip tape. So, mm. you know, it, it's not a, yes, they do make a kit where it's like, Hey, this kit's going to cover this, this kit's going to cover this, but What's your water pressure at your yeah. house? You know, some people are on a well. Some people are on county water. Some people are on city water. Do you have yeah. 50 pounds of pressure? Or do you have 10 pounds right. of pressure? You know, only certain drip tape is going to run certain amounts of pressure. Okay, let's say you've got 50 pounds of pressure. You're, you're, you're great. Are you running 20 100-foot mm. beds? Or are you running 10 100-foot beds? What are you doing? Yeah. You know, of course, 10 is going to be easier to run than 20 because that's double the water pressure or yeah. the mass, the volume that you're running. And I think that's something people don't think about is, Water pressure, yeah, just as simple. Well, water is just water, right? No, it's not. Yeah, when we you had to drip, take off our because I was struggling your regulator. with regulator. I took off the pressure regulator, and I thought I'm going to blow out every hose, but I, <laughs> yeah. I couldn't get more than twelve beds. You know, right, on, on right, long, right. I'm like, what's going on here? And sure enough, the same thing because I doubled my bed space. And I'm like, now I can get water. So you know, you have to take yeah. a regulator off, yeah. so now you can get full pressure to spread out. Yeah. Um, uh, additives or amendments, yeah. compost. You know, it, and if you're lucky enough, like like most of us are, where we have an area where we can get compost, like we were talking about compost today, you know, it's expensive. Compost yeah. isn't cheap, mm. you know, and so 
you know, if you're buying one yard of compost for the average backyard gardeners, you know, they're yeah. like, oh, it's no big deal. Buy 20, right. buy 40. And now you become dependent on it. Yes, and yeah. now you're dependent on it. Yeah. So now every year I need to get 20 yards of compost yeah. in the spring to get going. And then you've got trucking fees on top of the compost mm -hmm. because I don't know anyone that's got a truck big enough to haul 20 yards of compost to my house right. tomorrow that I can call. So now I have to hire somebody to come yeah. in or make 20 loads to the compost place with my truck. So right. with gas prices and everything else, it's cheaper to pay someone to come in truck. Um, am I growing undercover? Am I growing in outside? You know, you you know, oh, just buy a high tunnel. It's no big deal. What? Now you're adding yeah. an additional cost of adding a high tunnel to this frost blankets. Now you're yeah. doubling your frost blankets. Frost blankets aren't cheap. So now you're doubling that. Okay, well, I can't just throw a frost blanket on top of lettuce in the wintertime because it'll die. It'll make it freeze. Now I've got to put hoops in. So now I need yeah. 500 hoops to put in. Oh, wait, how do I get these hoops? i got to buy a bender to put hoops in. You know, or how do I pay shipping to get hoops that are pre-made? You know, there's companies that pre-make them, but now I've got shipping trucking costs on top of that. The trucking cost is more than buying the hoops. Yeah. You know, I mean, there's so much stuff into yeah. it. And, you know, it's not just as easy as adding one plus one makes two and you're, you're in the game. Right. You know, they think, oh, yeah, it's not as easy. Seed costs. If you're spending... A thousand to three thousand, four thousand dollars a year for seed costs, and now let's say you want to double. Now you're five thousand yeah. dollars a year. Where are you getting that money? So what you're you saying, know? this is like going from two kids to four kids. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Exa ex exactly. That and then uh, that's a great analogy yeah. on it. Yeah, because yeah. and, and I'm sure you've probably th thought of the same thing. You know, you get yeah. those questions all the time. Oh, it's just simple. Just just add another five hundred yeah. tomato plants. It'll be fine. Yeah. No, it won't be, you know, because then you have clips, then you have twine, then you have yeah. landscape fabric, then you have drip tape, then you have compost, then you have amendments, then you have, it just goes on and on. And that's just one variety. Right. That's not counting cucumbers or lettuce or carrots or anything like that, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so also some other thing, like the storage component, like uh, uh, I, I'm grateful. We bought this 6x12. It was actually advertised as a 6x10 walk-in. You saw it. Yeah, it I saw it. Yeah. Beat up thing. It was Very jealous. from a bar. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, it's got its problems, but it's it's working, but. I, I still remember uh, Curtis Stone. He's got like these two tiny little, yep. you know, yep. ones, and it was nice because he could shut one off, you know, when he's not using it. And but he always said, "Hey, go bigger with that." But you know, that's that's another thing is like it, the when you start compounding or scaling, it's like, can okay, I need storage? You need you know more refrigeration yep. space, more you know maybe a larger wash pack station, larger you know like. And for us, even like our microgreens, you saw we were mm -hmm. we were growing in that in that uh, bunker. You know, a little six by eight, I think it was, and and you know to scale that. Now you're in a room now, yeah. yeah. But you know, new problems, new challenges, and all of that. So yeah, it's it's uh yeah, it's another. it's the stuff on the back end that you know a lot of people don't think about, and it's very you know it's and it's yeah. stuff we think about every day because you know I I would love to double and triple my farm easily, yeah. but I don't have the manpower to do that, you know, and also you know you just don't have the cash flow I think to to do right. that you know, in, in a correct form. Yeah. You know, you can go to the bank and borrow money. You can do stuff like that. But if you're trying to do this and, and keep it reasonable and the costs down, so you don't have to charge yeah. triple what you're charging for a bag of lettuce, you know, the only way to do that is to, to start small and then grow yourself mm -hmm. out as your farm grows. You know, don't try to, don't try to keep up with the Joneses, I think, you know, and then that's my issue where I've done really good with that. I think, you know, I, I want to add on, but I've been, you know, luckily I have a wife that kind of reels me yeah, in just a little bit. Says, yeah, she's yeah. a very good sounding board. And she'll tell me, she says, hey, you need to slow, slow it up just a little bit. Just yeah. just a little bit, you know, kind of calm down and rein it in just the hair and then we'll figure it out. Mm -hmm. We'll always figure it out, you know. So I and so I'm blessed to have her on my side to stand behind me, you know, and, and tell me in my whisper in my ear and say, you need to slow down. Yeah. You know, so that's always a good thing to have that. But But yeah, it's just there's a lot of variables that go into right. this type of farming that, you know, and I think all of us would love to expand. All of us would love to sell double, triple the stuff. Yeah. And so, you know, because where we are, it's like, and in, in, we were chatting about this earlier, but like, where do you eventually want to get to? You know, like, um, and, and my wife and I, we always chat about that. We're trying to find this balance. Like, right. you know, do we want to have 20 employees? Do we want to have, you know, but the reality is, is I, we always want to be personal. We want to make sure that our, our prices are, are not going to have to suffer. I was just talking right. to somebody uh, last week or a week ago. But they sell, um, I think they're selling 12 cucumbers for a dollar. There's massive, it's like a 100-acre greenhouse up in Canada. and But then it gets down to, you know, where I'm selling a buck a cucumber. Right, right. right. So, I mean, you know, there, there's, you know, I don't have plans to scale to that level where I'm like, 
you know, selling a cucumber for 15 cents. Or you're growing a thousand acres of cucumbers. Yeah, Yeah, exactly. I don't think, I mean, their level of profit and level of um, enjoyment out of what they're doing, I think, has, was lost somewhere between, you know, you and I are still on this, on this verge of startup, (laughs) right? Like, oh, we're still, you know, we have a lot of hope and, you know, bright future is ahead of us. Whereas these guys are, you know, now all they do is just worry about a bottom dollar and, you know, there's, they're, they're a mile disconnected from where we are, you right? Know? And so finding that balance of scale, you know, is I think what's going to be challenging to get to. I mean, obviously you're going to keep wanting to strive and strive, but at some point, you know, we're going to have to, you know, stand here and and leave that to them, you know? right? And I I think you're going to have to because there, there's no way us as market gardeners are going to be able to compete with big ag yeah. farm like that when it comes to that. You know, for one, we don't have the infrastructure. Um, for two, we don't have the acreage. Yeah. Uh, you know, a lot of those farms are on 500,000 acre farms yeah. of just cabbage or just lettuce or just yeah. broccoli or something. And that's, you know, that's how they're, they're getting their margin is, you know, they're selling so much, they can lower that price down and still make right. their money on top of but it. But they're, they're compromising because they're spraying. And, exactly. You know, the, exactly. So the, the, the quality suffers. Um, the ship, you know, I mean, just having maybe two weeks in transit where our stuff is, I know with us, ours is, you know, I pick the day before, the day of before market. Yeah. So that way it's always going to be fresh within 24 hours. That's that's my whole yeah. thing. I, I always want it to be fresh within 24 hours. Well, and the one thing to <laughs> also note on that is like, and this dawned on me just last year, I think, but like what you get in the grocery store, it doesn't necessarily taste the as, well, it definitely doesn't taste as good as a fresh tomato, but right. it's because they're sacrificing uh, flavor, uh, for shelf life. Yes. You know? yes so yes. they're they're growing cultivars that are great for long term shipping right. or storage or longer term storage and you know something that's gonna look pretty and so it looks it physically has the appeal but and it you know it's gonna literally be you know not uh, it's gonna sh- store longer, right? But right, not, right. But the sacrifice is it's flavor. It's flavor. Yeah, yeah, that that's always gonna be your sacrifice on that. Yeah. But I think, Carl, I want to thank you for letting me come out to the farm today and yeah. checking it out and uh, just seeing your day-to-day thing. And um, I appreciate it a lot. Yeah, thank you for coming down. Affleck.